V1. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Terrain. Terrain. Pull up. Terrain. Welcome to the Flight Safety Detectives. Hosts John Golia and Greg Fife, two of the world's most respected aviation safety experts, talk all things related to aviation and aerospace. This podcast and the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel are brought to you by the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, PAMA, and Avemco Insurance, a world-class provider of aviation insurance and your one-stop for all general aviation insurance needs. Get a customized quote at avemco.com or give them a call at 888-879-0389. Tell them you're a listener of the show and receive a 5% discount. Now it's time to buckle up because it's wheels up for the latest episode of Flight Safety Detectives. Well, hello, Todd. It's you and I again. Indeed. And how are you doing today? It's going quite well. I went out uh, up yesterday, learned a few things. And realize once again my limitations as a pilot and the fact that uh, there's nothing like the real thing. You can simulate all you want, even with a full motion simulator, even with your X-Plane or Microsoft simulator type stuff at home. But nothing takes the place of all the environmental cues, all the feedback you get from being in a real airplane with real wind, you know, rocking your wings back and forth. That's true. That's true. It's too sanitary. Sanitary in a simulator. Well, we got an interesting airplane to talk about today, even though it's it's an incomplete investigation by the NTSB at this point. It's uh, still quite interesting and has some value given what they know already. So we're going to talk about a single engine Beaver uh, on floats out in Puget Sound, Washington, your old home ground. Indeed. And it just crashed last month. And from all the reports, it was flying along and then just did a nosedive into the water. So that, that had a lot of people very interested. And uh, they also couldn't find the airplane for a while. Uh, most people don't realize how deep those, those uh, areas, because they're not that wide in some areas, they're not that wide, but they are damn deep. Unfortunately, the University of Washington had equipment on scene that was able to map the bottom and they were able to find the wreckage field. And because this was a very high angle impact into the water, the aircraft fractured uh, after impact and they were able to recover most of the structure of the aircraft. And fortunately, part of the structure that was recovered was the empennage, which had some key evidence in there, which led to very recently, compared to the date we did this broadcast, just a couple of days ago, uh, the NTSB uh, coming out with a safety recommendation for an inspection of all similar type Beaver aircraft, uh, excuse me, of, uh, of otter aircraft. Fortunately, in this case, University of Washington had some fairly sophisticated equipment to map the bottom, map the wreckage, and they were able to pull up most of the wreckage, including the critical part, what turns out to be the critical part of the wreckage that revealed that the possible cause of this was something that was rather rather tiny. And again, John, you have uh, worked with this before. I believe it's called a lock ring, and we'll flash a picture of it on the uh, video version of this uh, podcast. Yeah, when, when uh, you know, when, when things are assembled that go on airplanes that you don't want to come apart, you have to have positive locks to keep them together. And the simplest form is safety wire, which is just stainless steel wire that's twisted in a, in a certain way, and it prevents something from loosening up. Or you might have a cotter pin in a castellated nut and a drilled bolt. That will also prevent the nut from coming loose. Well, sometimes on actuators, uh, you can't always do that. And so what you do is they have some lock rings that will install between the frame of, a, of the component and the piece that's movable. So it would come in and it would lock it so it wouldn't be able to be, uh, come loose. So the manufacturers have a number of tools at their disposal, which could lock something up from coming unloosed. But it requires whatever it is to be used. 
ought to be properly uh, used in securing itself to lock the whole assembly together. And in this case, it appears that this lock ring uh, may not have been installed properly, or it may have broken, which occasionally happens because it's spring steel, most of them, and that they're under tension. So it, it's possible that it could have broken, or it's possible that it could have been installed improperly. And the uh, investigators thought that uh, this was a possible cause in part because of the way this actuator was put together. It was two metal barrels that were threaded together and they looked at the threads. There was no evidence of the threads being pulled apart as though there was some sort of extreme force on it, but rather that it unscrewed. And this lock ring was put in such a way that it would keep it from unscrewing itself. Now, whether this took place over the course of a flight or over many flights, it's unclear. In fact, at this point, the lock ring, ring itself has not been recovered, though both parts of that actuator were recovered. Yeah, then I'm sure they'll put them under the microscope to see uh, if they were working a little bit. You know, corrosion would get in there. In the picture that's, uh, that's released with the NTSB uh, report, there, it looks to be very rusted inside where that, that lock ring would, it, would uh, reside. It, uh, you know, it's going to take some looking. So that, this is the point where the NTSB laboratory will be doing uh, their job, and they are, they are very good at what they do. So they will be able to determine, uh, at least in a general sense, how long ago that uh, locking clip was missing. And what the NTSB did as part of uh, their addressing this issue before the final report came out, they sent out a recommendation, both the FAA and Transport Canada, to um, basically mandate a one-time inspection of all the outers that have this sort of uh, setup to see if they have a similar problem. And this aircraft, although it was originally built in the 1950s and designed in the 1950s, still very, very popular in some parts of the world, especially places like Puget Sound, where you have a lot of waterways and lakes and Puget Sound itself, and in Alaska, where there's a lot of backcountry flying, where these aircraft might be used with conventional landing gear, larger tired landing gear for soft services, or float plane use. And I believe even uh, skis can be, be applied to this aircraft. So it is a very uh, well-used aircraft in rough backcountry and water kind of situations. And even though this was in the Seattle area, it was flying to Renton, which is very close to Seattle. Uh, there are quite a few planes every day in Seattle flying in and out of the metropolitan area. They're landing on uh, bodies of water. Well, that's a popular tourist ride there. I mean, I've stayed there in downtown at the hotel and right on, right on the back of the hotel was the, the, uh, the dock for all the beavers and otters that would take all the tourists for rides. I'm a little concerned here for, for my fellow mechanics uh, if that, that ring was inadvertently left out because that's a, that's a no-no. That's a no-no. And, and it's unclear what level of investigation is being done with the operator of that aircraft. And it was unclear from looking at the available information from the NTSB whether that was done in-house or whether that was done through a third party. Uh, but certainly uh, for those of you out there who are involved in operating these kinds of aircraft, I highly recommend that you take a look at the statements from the NTSB and we'll be making uh, those available on, on the website after we launched the, uh, this episode. And if you're operating these aircraft, flying these aircraft, or even plan to fly on one of these aircraft, you might get with the operator and ask them, hey, have you seen this? Have you checked this out? And yes. I tried to look for similar accidents with this model of aircraft. I couldn't find any, but again, this is an aircraft used throughout North America and elsewhere. And so there may be other incidents there that we're simply not aware of because there had not been the level of investigation that typically happens with the NTSB that happens with all of these events. Well, yeah, if I remember right, that the Canadian authorities had issued an AD note out against this uh, type of airplane for something in the tail. It may have been corrosion. I'm going by memory now, so I could be wrong. Uh, but there was an AD out against the tail of this airplane, and it was not adopted by the US. Now, the type certificate 
for this airplane is Canadian. The manufacturer is Canadian. In fact, it's no longer uh, the original manufacturer, which was de Havilland. It's now uh, Viking. They had bought the type certificates for the, the Beaver and the single engine order and the two engine order. So they own the type certificate now and they've been involved with the investigation. Uh, so that'll help the investigators because they're the, they have the engineering talent to, to uh, help understand uh, some of the processes that led to this failure. So uh, from that end, it's, it's a good, uh, good that they're involved. It's not good that we killed 10 people and it will really not be good if it was a mechanic who made the mistake for that individual. You know, I'm talking a second about, uh, about people that make mistakes. So, and it, it goes across the board in aviation. But I want to talk about some maintenance accidents. You know, 30 years ago, crashed a, a commuter airplane out of uh, Houston, Texas. And, and that airplane, that, that accident was caused by an airplane that came out of maintenance and 47 screws that hold on a piece of the leading edge of the tail were not installed. And the, the process, a complicated process, but uh, there were several different mechanics that were involved that, that uh, led up to the mistake. And I'm, I've been told, I don't know this to be fact, but I've been told one of those persons uh, actually committed suicide. And we have another accident in Chicago with DC-10 American Airlines that lost an engine on takeoff. Big splash in the paper led to the grounding of the DC-10 for a period of time. And uh, one of the mechanics that was involved in that mis mistake uh, also committed suicide. So, you know, sometimes there's more victims in a plane crash than the ones that were on the airplane. Uh, and I've seen families destroyed in my dealings with the families after uh, accidents where the families were destroyed and never the same after the, the loss. So really, uh, it's really a multiple level tragedy when we have events like this. And I hope that uh, when it comes down to it, that they, uh, that if, if, if this was a mechanic that made this mistake, that that company makes sure that that mechanic gets some uh, help from employee assistance groups or whatever. I worked, at, I worked an accident uh, up here in New England when I was at the board and it actually destroyed several mechanics. They left the industry, uh, went other areas away from aviation, but we did get them help from the very beginning so that they possibly avoid any negative outcomes on their part. As far as I know, there wasn't any, but I have lost contact with that for years now. But In investigations like this, uh, typically take months or even years, but the uh, fallout, at least from the public perception or the industry perception of it could be immediate because unlike 30 years ago, 10 years ago, or in some respects, even five years ago, something happens today. A lot of information is instantly out there well before the official investigation is, is even underway. And there's quite a bit of speculation out there, some of it valid, some of it uh, more entertainment oriented, that happens almost immediately. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the full story. The full story may not be out there for a while. And when it does come out, it might be a whole lot more, how should I say it, uh, complex than what it would first appear. You might think, oh, well, this pin wasn't there, or maybe the, the pin was not manufactured right, or the mechanic did something wrong. Well, that's an assumption that's not based on a full set of facts. So I would say that with this event and any other event that's under investigation, Wait until things play out before you start pointing fingers. And even if they do play out, you really can't, in most cases, point your finger at one person or one organization whenever there is a major accident like this. Well, there's always a chain. You know, the chain of events that leads up to an accident. And sometimes it can be quite long. You know, value jet in the Everglades, there was eight places where if one person had done their job, in, in one, not the same person, eight different people, eight different places, 
if they had done their job, that that accident would not have occurred. So the, the issue here, the takeaway right now is this airplane may have lost control of the tail of tail control of the tail surfaces. And that's what led to the, to the nose over in the crash. So if you have a squirrely airplane, because I can't believe that this airplane didn't start to exhibit some unusual flying characteristics as this loosened up. So if you have an airplane, you're out there flying, and even a little airplane, and you start to get squirrely on the flight controls, get it in to get somebody to look at it. Don't just live at it and, and, and live with it. But also, I recently was, was saw an incident where the pilot was co complaining about his autopilot. And he complained a few times about his autopilot being, my word, squirrely. And uh, nothing was done with it because he, he had taken into shops that they didn't have avionics available and they, nobody looked at the airplane. And it really was a hardware issue. He had control rods for his horizontal or his elevator loose and ultimately it came off and caused an accident. So, you know what, if you, something doesn't feel right, get it on the ground, get somebody to give it a good looking. This is especially important on aircraft, including the accident aircraft we're talking today, talking about today, that does not have a cockpit voice recorder, does not have a flight data recorder. Uh, sometimes the only information you have about a misbehaving aircraft is what somebody documents in the logbook, the pilot logbook, maintenance logbook, et cetera, or what somebody goes out of their way to bring to the attention of those people who are operating the aircraft and sweeping it under the rug is not something that's advisable at any level of aviation. Yes, you got to pay attention to your airplane. You know, and I'll give you my, my pre-flight pitch beforehand. I got a, a nice pre-flight accident that we're going to do soon too. But you know what? You got to touch your airplane. You got to know what's going on. You got to go out there and wiggle those flight controls, right? And after you do that a few times, you'll know it's normal. And then someday in, in the case that I just gave the example of, it, that was obvious they never did that, even though it was a low wing airplane, never did that. Uh, had he done it, he would have certainly felt that, that that elevator was loose and the accident wouldn't have happened because he would have found, they would have found the problem and it would have not occurred. So when you go and do your pre flights, you've got to touch your airplane, you got to wiggle everything. I see guys going out and, and really almost jumping on the wingtips as they go around. Listen, it. want to see if anything, you know, if it's going to re respond the way you, you've done it every time. All of a sudden, if it doesn't respond the way it has the last 50 times, wait a minute, what's going on? Do I have a flat strike? What's going on? Or if it bounces too much, what's, you know, take a look. Do I have a flat tire, soft tire? There's lots of things that can cause it, but it's all meant to just keep your mind in the game. In fact, yesterday, literally yesterday, I touched an airplane in a way I've never touched before. Turns out the aircraft I was flying yesterday had just come out of maintenance, had brand new uh, oil in the crankcase. And I take out the dipstick to measure it and usually can see where the oil line is because, you know, as oil is used, it gets a little, this was like absolutely clean. It's like, what? Is this like empty of oil? I put it back in, took it out again, looked at it closely. I thought, I still can't see anything. Okay, let me do the touch test. I touched right above where I thought it should be, nice and dry. Touch right below, there's oil. It's like, okay, this proves that this airplane is ready to fly. Yep. yep. There's all sorts of little tricks like that you've got to learn and you, you've got to uh, pay attention. Simple as that. Well, I think we've alerted everybody that they need to pay attention to their airplane. Keep an eye out for this, this uh, auto crash because it's going to get interesting now. Uh, with this, you know, we're going to have, they asked for feedback. The, the FAA is asking for feedback from the operators after they do the inspection. So it's going to be interesting to see what comes back after the inspection. So Todd, I'll give you the last word. Well, this is a, an example of an event that happened, which unfortunately took lives, but it happened to happen with an aircraft that was designed 
literally over 70 years ago. An aircraft that had seen decades of service, and you would think, this isn't a frontline airplane. This isn't, this isn't an airplane that carries 100 passengers. No, but this is the way aviation works. A particular problem was found. There's a potential for it to affect hundreds or dozens of other aircraft. And the systems that are in place took action. And the action that was taken by the NTSB and likely will be taken by the FAA and Transport Canada are prudent actions. And those of you who are in aviation who have a direct involvement in something like this, you have your own set of prudent actions to take, as John just mentioned. If you see something unusual, tell somebody, document it. If you think something is acting squirrely on your airplane, don't just accept it. Don't just say, eh, I'm good enough to deal with this. Correct it if you can. Okay. And as I always do when we're signing off, you know, if you're going to go flying, do a good session of pre-planning. Start it before you even get to the airport, before you leave your house or the hotel room. When you get to the airport, do it again. When you get out to your airplane, good pre-flight. Learn what a good pre-flight is. You know, it's not just a check list in the cockpit. Right? It's not, you know, there's one company that makes checklists for walk-arounds, but I have not looked at them, so I don't know how, how good they are. But you need to develop a, your checklist, your own checklist for your airplane. There are a lot of YouTube videos about doing walk-arounds on airplanes. Uh, I've looked at just one type of airplane and in, in those YouTube channel videos, uh, uh, some are very thorough, some are not very thorough. So you gotta, you gotta really do your own homework on uh, what to look at. And after you get up in the air, please put that head on a swivel because we're still having too many mid-airs in and around the airport. A lot of students today flying. You know, I learned to fly at an un uncontrolled airport. I learned early on, you keep looking, keep turning your head, you never stop. And, and you know what, it's funny, I just think of this. It served me well because even now today, all these years later, when I drive, I'm always looking in the rear view mirror. I'm constantly putting my eyes on, on the mirrors. Right? And that's just a habit that I got when I was very young. And it, it continues today. Okay, to everybody, please fly safe. To listen or watch more episodes of this show, go to FlightSafetyDetectives.com, the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel, or your favorite place to listen to podcasts. To contact John and Greg about the show, send them an email at FlightSafetyDetectives at gmail.com. And remember, for aviation insurance needs, contact Avemco Insurance at avemco.com or give them a call at 888 888- 879-0389. Mention Flight Safety Detectives and receive a 5% discount. Thanks for listening to the Flight Safety Detectives and remember to always fly safe.